The people of the Caribbean have been forced to realize after 50 years of nation building that they have inherited a royal colonial mess. That is correct. They have inherited a mess. When I was asked to submit my first report to the Prime Ministers and Presidents of the Caribbean a month ago, I said to all of my heads of government, what have you been doing in the Caribbean in the last 50 years since most of these countries have become independent? I said, Mr. Prime Ministers, Mr. Presidents, what you have been doing has been cleaning up the mess you have inherited from Europe. And with your greatest efforts, with your greatest efforts, you are not going to be able to clean this mess up unless those responsible for the mess are brought back to the table to discuss that mess. That is the heart, that is the heart of the Caribbean Reparatory Justice Program. You know, the slave owners, they got reparations. When the British Parliament legislated emancipation in 1834, the slave owners stood up in Parliament because most of those members of Parliament were the slave owners. In the House of Commons and the House of Lords, the vast majority were slave owners. And they stood up in Parliament and they told that Parliament, over the last 200 years, when we, the slave owners, have been bringing the wealth back to Britain to make Britain great, when we were bringing the wealth back to Britain out of slave trade and slavery, and we have turned this country into the first industrial nation, when we were building Britain with slavery, no one in this parliament said anything. But now that Britain is on the path to sustainable growth, and the profits from slavery still important but not critical, suddenly there is moral outrage. Suddenly you have discovered that slavery is a crime. Suddenly you have discovered after 200 years that slave trading is a crime and crimes against humanity. Well, because of your newly found humanitarian instincts, you are going to pay us reparations. And that is what, that is what the slave owner said. The slave owners said there will be no emancipation without reparations for us. The British Parliament then agreed and voted 20 million pounds to pay the slave owners for the loss of their property. Now, 20 million pounds might seem to you to be a small sum today but let me take you back to the economy of Great Britain in 1833. In 1833, 20 million pounds represented 40% of the national expenditure. 40% of the national expenditure for that year went to compensate the slave owners for the loss of, the, of their property. They ripped their own treasury. That 40% of national expenditure is greater than Obama's stimulus packages combined. That is what they got for themselves. 40% of their expenditure. Now let me tell you how much that is today. 20 million pounds in 1834 is 76 billion pounds today. In today's money, 76 billion pounds. That's what they got for themselves. And 40% of British national expenditure in today's money 
in today's money, 40% of British national expenditure will be 200 billion pounds. That is to give you a sense of the magnitude of what the slave owners got for their own reparations. Now, you are our enslaved ancestors. Don't forget who you are. That's the role you're playing tonight. You got nothing. But you stood up and you said, how about us? We have, we have the records of the enslaved population sending petitions to the British government. What about reparations for us? If you read the House of Commons debates, they were saying to the enslaved, be grateful that you have got freedom, go away. Be grateful you have got freedom, go away. And be vigilant that we do not reintroduce slavery. Be vigilant. And bear in mind, this is what the French government had done. The French government had abolished slavery in 1794 and reintroduced slavery in 1812. Reintroduced it. So don't think that emancipation was stable and secure. You live in fear of reintroduction. That was always there. The first three generations of free people lived in fear of reintroduction. It had happened before. It could happen again. And if you consider then that the slave owners got their reparations, and we have got nothing. It is because, following the Zong case, what the governments of Europe have said, you are not worthy of it. You are not deserving of it. And understand, there is no people on this planet thus far, and we have looked at all of the cases of reparations. Weak people do not get reparations. Disorganized people do not get reparations. People without discipline do not get reparations. So if you are going to commit to the reparatory justice program, you need, as a people, all over this world, all African peoples, we need to be organized, we need to be disciplined, and we need to respect ourselves. And let me give you the worst case scenario. In 2004, President Aristide of Haiti made a formal request to the French government for reparatory justice. And this is what he said. When Haiti became independent in 1804, every country in this hemisphere isolated Haiti. Every nation, every colony in this hemisphere from Alaska to Argentina Every society in this entire hemisphere was based on African slavery. And here was one little country in the middle of the hemisphere that had declared slavery a crime against humanity and had placed in their constitution, Article 44, any person of African descent who arise on the shores of Haiti shall be declared a free person and a citizen of the Republic. They put that in their constitution. So Haiti had declared war on slavery throughout the world and they were on their own. And do not think for a moment that that constitutional provision 
was not taken advantage of. I am currently working on a research paper of a case where the Constitution was tested. 1816, a group of 17 Africans in Jamaica at Port Royal stole a ship and sailed to Haiti. Stole a ship in the harbor and sailed off to Haiti. Arrived in Haiti and were declared free persons and citizens. The government of Jamaica, the colonial government, wrote to the president of Haiti, President Petion, and demanded the return of the property of Jamaica. President Petion wrote back and said, Dear Governor, the ship is in the harbor. Come and get it. But as for these people who were aboard, our Constitution does not recognize slavery. They are now citizens of the Republic of Haiti. And we have... We have all of that correspondence. For the next 50 years, African peoples from all the islands, from Florida, from the Keys, African peoples were flooding across the Caribbean Ocean trying to get to Haiti because it was the only place where you could become free and be a citizen. The boat people were going to Haiti. The boat people were going to Haiti. And we have that history. And so all the governments of Europe said, we are not going to recognize this new state until the French government, who they had defeated on the battlefield, recognizes the state. The US government said, we will not recognize Haiti until the French recognize Haiti. That's what they all said. And so, in 1825, on the 21st anniversary of nationhood in Haiti, the Haitian government had a decision to make. Celebrations are taking place in Port-au-Prince, 21 years of nationhood, of freedom. They have a choice to make. Should they continue to be isolated by the world economy? Or should they pay the reparations and be reinserted into the world economy? The Haitian cabinet sat and deliberated and took that decision that to be re-established into the world of nations, they should pay reparations to the slave owners. And so the French government sent a team of accountants to Haiti to do an evaluation of the loss of property. 300,000 enslaved Africans were valued, cow, sheep, goat, horses, kitchen utensils, everything the slave owners had lost was added up and calculated. And bear in mind that in 1825, there were seven members of the cabinet of the country, seven members of the cabinet who were former slaves, a value was put on them also because they were former slaves. And that amount came to 150 million francs. And the Haitian government was told, repay the French people 150 million francs. Let me tell you, the Haitian government did not complete the payment of that reparation until 1948. From 1825 to 1948, and in that long century, in that long century, the French government and people bled Haiti of all of its foreign exchange. We have done the economic history of Haiti. In some years, up to 70% of all the earnings of the Haitian people were paid over to the French government in reparations. The impoverishment of Haiti, the driving of that country into poverty, lies at the doorstep of the French nation. And so, President Aristide, in his right, rightful manner, asked the French government to repair 
that money that was criminally extorted from the people of Haiti. And we know that it was criminal extortion because when the cabinet of Haiti was meeting to make that decision, there were French warships in the harbor of Haiti. There were warships in the harbor of Haiti. You sign or we will invade. Extortion. The contemporary value of that money, today's value, is worth 21 billion US dollars. That is what that 150 million paid over 100 plus years is 21 billion dollars. And so President Aristide said, we're not asking the French government for what is yours. We are asking you for what has been taken from us. Please repay that. The French invaded Haiti. Aristide was overthrown. And the rest is history. But the people of Haiti have not given up because when the heads of governments met to approve the CARICOM plan, President Martelly of Haiti was standing there voting in support of this. So what is the Caribbean Reparatory Justice Program, the 10-point plan? This document is on the internet. It's a plan which says we are going to redefine the reparations movement. It is not about standing on street corners expecting handouts from anyone. It is not a mendicant plan. It is not a plan that allows us or insists that we must bend and bow to anyone. It's a plan that has within it the pride and the principles of dignity and self-respect of our peoples. And so we say, we are going to link reparations to our developmental needs as a people. It's a development paradigm to rebuild our communities, to rebuild our people, and to get the resources that have been stolen from them to be brought back to help with their development. The first item on the agenda, the first point, is where we must begin. There must be a formal apology. First item. First item. All of the governments of Europe have issued statements of regret. We regret what we have done. Well, you know the difference between a statement of regret and an apology. If I step on your foot, I can look at you and I can say to you, I regret stepping on your foot. No, go away and leave me, and leave me alone. You can ouch if you wish, but I'll walk away. I regret this. Go away and leave me alone. I apologize. I say to you, I apologize. I have caused you pain. I apologize. I will take you to the hospital if you need to be taken, and if you need surgery on your foot, I am willing to work with you to restore your health. That is what an apology says. And one would imagine, therefore, that every government of Europe, every government of Europe that functions in the world of diplomacy will be willing to rise up and take responsibility. We need to help them to do the right thing because the right thing must be done. We believe that until that apology is given to every African child, woman, man on this planet, the healing of humanity will not commence. We can camouflage it. We can put a plaster on the sore, but that wound is not going to heal until that apology is made. And we know that. The second point in our program is repatriation. 
we are stolen people. The 30 million Africans shipped across the Atlantic are stolen people. Stolen people have a right, if they so desire, to be sent back into the space from whence they came. And there are many Africans in the Caribbean, in America, who have opted to return to Africa. There are seven countries at the moment in Africa that have declared their willingness to reintegrate diaspora Africans back into the continent. At the end of last year in Ethiopia, I visited the town of Shashamani where there are 30,000 of you back in Ethiopia living. 30,000. The government has made provision to give you land, but you still have to make your investment in your travel and your settlement and all of the challenges associated with healthcare and education, you still have to meet those. We say the governments of Europe have stolen these people from Africa and must put in place a repatriation program to fund the resettlement of all those who wish to return. This is very important, very important indeed. For a hundred years, while the Rastafarian peoples have been speaking about reparations, many of us were silent. But they were the ones who kept the flame alive. And that is why we pay respect to the Rastafari for standing up over the years. And many of them have returned. Some of them are having problems at the moment with the legal costs of accessing health care and education for their children. All of those issues must be taken on board and settled in a coherent program of repatriation. The third item is a settlement for the concerns of the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, who they call Caribs and Arawaks who were exterminated and, how, and who are now living in a few constant, a few what you call reservations. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have done a great job in rehabilitating those indigenous peoples into the society. So has Dominica. On my campus, each year, the Cafel campus, we issue 10 full scholarships to indigenous peoples every year to come to the campus and pursue their academic studies. And I can tell you this, the first time that most black students have ever met indigenous peoples is on the Cafel campus. Most people in Jamaica and Barbados have never met indigenous peoples. And now they meet them as students in the dormitories, in the classrooms, one of them did so well, brilliant first class honors in law, went off to law school, and now she is the attorney general in Dominica. The first, the first indigenous woman to hold an office in government since the independence period. So we are going to rebuild them. The British government has a responsibility to fund a program for the rebuilding of the welfare of these indigenous peoples. Our fourth item relates to cultural institutions. You know, I attended high school in England. Most of my family, they're still living in England. We were part of that migration of the 50s. Could not get jobs in the island. Half of my family came to North America, the other half went to England all looking for jobs. You could go to England today and go into a state-of-the-art multimedia museum dedicated to the education of school children with respect to the history of the African enslavement. Brilliant facilities in Liverpool, in Manchester, in Bristol, in London. School teachers can take hundreds of kids into these facilities and educate those children about the horrendous nature of this history. They even have slave ships in the museum 
where you could enter it and feel a simulation of what it's like to be on a slave ship. All of that exists in Britain, and there isn't one in the Caribbean. Not one, and the Caribbean is where the crime was committed. Am I going to ask the government of Jamaica that has all the problems of developing their economy, Barbados, Trinidad, St. Vincent, to take 30 million US dollars to build such a museum. The British government has to build those museums across the Caribbean. It is their responsibility. Then there is the case of public health. Let me tell you this. The image you have of Caribbean peoples, and you would have heard that at the moment, the fastest man in the world is Jamaican. The fastest woman in the world is Jamaican. The second fastest man and the second fastest woman. And the image you have is that Caribbean peoples are super athletic. But let me tell you this. If you strip off the veneer of the sportsman, and if you use the criterion of chronic diseases, hypertension, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes, the black people of the Caribbean are the sickest people on earth. We are the sickest people on earth if we use the criterion of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. There is an epidemic in the Caribbean. 60% of all black people in the Caribbean over the age of 60, 60% 60 of all the black people in the Caribbean over the age of 60 have hypertension, diabetes, or both. It is an epidemic that is outstretching the capacity of these governments to control. It has to do with that stress profile of slavery, apartheid, colonization. If you take a people and for 400 years you enslave them, you rape their women, you sell their children, then you subject those people to apartheid, at the end of that, what do you expect? What do you expect? What you have is an explosion of chronic diseases. But we say, okay, slavery is over, but we are now in the jet stream of the consequences. We are now in the jet stream, and we are sick. And if you go into a hospital, you are hypertensive, and there isn't a family anywhere in the Caribbean that half of their members over the age of 50 do not have a chronic disease. And let me tell you, the only other place in the world that has the same health profile as the Caribbean is the state of Mississippi. For the same reason. For the same purpose. For the same reason. The same reason. Denigration, exploitation. And if you go into a hospital with hypertension, they will give you medication. There are probably about six or seven different types of drugs that they will give you. But you know what? They don't work very well on us. Because they are clinically tried on white folks. Hypertension drugs are drugs that are ingested, go into the bloodstream, the brain sends a message to the cells to open up to allow things to happen. With white folks, there is a 95% response to the cells and how the drugs work. With black folks, it's a 70% response because we are different. But guess what? Guess what? The drugs work very well on the Africans in Africa. So the Africans in Africa have the same very good response as white folks. It's we who have been genetically modified by slavery. We are the ones who have the problem. We are the ones with the problem. We are the ones with the problem. And we go to the pharmaceutical companies and we say, okay, what is required, we need to do some pharmaceutical research, some biochemical research. It's just a matter of doing biochemical research, take some DNA samples, do all the cell work on the Africans in the diaspora, and have the drugs adjusted a little bit to accommodate our genetic structures. 
And do you know what the pharmaceuticals say? There are only 15 million black people in the Caribbean. Are we going to spend $50 million of research for such a small market? If the Africans in Africa had this problem, we would do it because there's a market. But there are just a few million of you. You have survived and only a few million of you. We have been working in our medical faculty to do that pharmaceutical research, that biochemical research to make the adjustments. And I can tell you, it can be done, but it is very expensive research. Very expensive research. And we say to the British and the French and the Dutch government, you must sponsor this research to help us to find the solution. Because many of the people in the Caribbean who have died of strokes, heart attacks, coronary diseases could be alive if we had the appropriate medication to treat these issues specific to us because we have been modified by them through that slavery process. It's a major research undertaking. It needs to be done. And if we're going to save our lives in the future, this research has to be done and these drugs must be adjusted. Then there's a question of illiteracy. Illiteracy. Take Jamaica, for example, as the largest society in the English-speaking nation of the Caribbean. Some three million Jamaicans at the moment live on that island. The British took Jamaica in 1655 and ruled Jamaica from 1655 to 1962 when it became independent, 300 years. At the end of that process, when Jamaica became independent and the British moved out, Jamaican flag went up, 70% of the black people in Jamaica were functionally illiterate. They left after 300 years, having taken all the riches out of Jamaica and use the people for their enrichment. They left three quarters of those black people in Jamaica functionally illiterate. And then say to the government of Jamaica, now go away and develop. Go away and develop. There is no nation on this planet. There is no body of economics that's available to us that can take a nation if three quarters of its people cannot read and write and develop within 50 years. It is impossible. The government of Jamaica does its best, invests heavily in education. Up to 40% sometimes of the national budget goes into education and health, but the problem they inherited was so enormous. It is so enormous. And what is true of Jamaica is true of every other island across the region in terms of the challenge of uprooting illiteracy and making sure that all of our people have a shot at college. We say to the British government, you have created this context. You need to come and work with us on an education program to rebuild the intellectual and academic competencies of our people because you drove them into illiteracy. <laughs> then all across the Caribbean, and also I have noticed recently in West Africa, there is something called skin bleaching where black folks are bleaching the blackness out of their beautiful skin. Across the inner cities, we see black folks psychologically impaired and bleaching the beautiful blackness out of their skin because the world continues to tell them that their black skin is not beautiful and that they're not going to progress in the world with their black skin. They're not going to rise up through the business sector, the academic sector, the church. They're not going to rise up through the systems if their skin is too black. Recently in Trinidad, there was a public conversation where it was said that the leader of the opposition is too black to be prime minister. That conversation was taking place. 
Across the region, there is still this challenge. What are we going to do to put an end to this? We say what we need is the eighth item, an African knowledge network. School children across the Caribbean, school teachers, ought to be able to take hundreds of children every summer to West Africa to attend other schools, partner with other schools, and have cultural education to be reinserted into their past. Every Caribbean school should be paired with an African school and those kids go out there on summer tours and rediscover their ancestral roots. That is required to rebuild. Because we are the only people, we are the only people on this planet that do not know specifically where we are from. And that is the damage that has been done. I spend, I spend much of my summers in Europe attending the archives across those capitals. I see white folks from North America who know exactly which village their ancestors came from. They know which village in France, which village in Germany, which village in Poland, in Greece, in England, in Ireland. They know exactly which village their ancestors in America came from and they go to visit those villages. You cannot visit because you don't know anything about it. And therefore, we are in a specific and peculiar problem of having a unique challenge of not knowing exactly where we are from. But a general view would do. A general view would begin with. A general view. Because you know what? The new technology, the new DNA technology, will help us to narrow this down into the communities. We will know. We will know. We will get there. But we need a program to move the next generation of young folks out of this hemisphere on regular educational trips. And again, we say that the British and the French and the Dutch and all of those slave trading nations have to pay for this. And so we have put together this 10-point plan. This 10-point plan. The final item is debt cancellation because we know that our governments have found themselves with tremendous fiscal gaps, largely because, as I have said, since the independence period, they have been using public expenditure to clean up the mess that they have inherited. Health, education, backward agriculture, all of that have driven most of our countries into a fiscal deficit, trying to develop to give people a shot at a better life. And we have put this plan together, and the heads of governments have said that shortly they are going to be writing to all the governments of Europe to invite them to a summit to discuss this 10-point plan. And our heads of governments have been very clear. They have said diplomacy must be given a chance to work. Diplomacy must be given a chance to work. We are going to invite them into a summit, into the context of international diplomacy, to speak about this legacy and to speak about reparatory justice. It is and will be a phenomenal movement in the history of the world. It will be a great moment. It will be a great moment. I hope that those governments of Europe will accept that invitation from CARICOM to sit in a formal round table to discuss this legacy of the crimes they have committed. We hope all well-meaning people do hope that they will accept that invitation and have a forum in the spirit of human reconciliation. But in the event that they do not, there is an international court of justice where we will go to seek justice. I am an academic, and my training 
insist upon forms of conversation that touches upon the human imagination. We as academics, we work on the assumption that humanity, given the right context, will do the right thing. We must proceed on that basis because we are academics. That in the right context, with information and knowledge, and with human goodwill, solutions can be found. In the Nuremberg trials in Germany, there was no precedent to handle that kind of situation. The Germans had decided, the Third Reich, to march millions of black peoples, Jewish peoples, and gypsies into those concentration camps. There was no law, no court, with any background history on how to handle that case. But the judges of the world were creative. And I have great confidence in jurists, great confidence in jurists to creatively find mechanisms and machinery to achieve objectives that are required for the moment. I do believe that. Absolutely, I do believe that. That systems can be found to bring justice. When I read the conversations in the British House of Lords in 2008 discussing reparations, it saddened me that the one black member, the one black member of the British House of Lords, Lord Morris of Hansworth, stood up and told the House of Lords, my ancestors were enslaved in Jamaica. I know the pain and the horror of growing up in that legacy. But this crime that has been committed against the African people is so large. It is such an international crime that I cannot imagine any system of law or diplomacy that could bring justice to such a crime. And I say to Lord Morris, I can imagine it. Yes. Because if you cannot imagine, if a crime is so large that your imagination cannot be wrapped around it in order to find a path to justice, I say collectively all of us in here can find that path. We can find it. So no crime. No crime is too large. No crime is too large. And this crime has been the greatest crime of the modern era. And all of us will work together to find a way forward. I thank you so much. Well, you hear it. You know it. Drummers. Give us some volume, give us some volume now. Yeah. You know, it's spiritual, it connects. It connects us through generations of our people. And so at this point in time, I want to bring before you none other than the brother minister, Louis Farrakhan.